All right, good evening, and welcome to the East Baton Rouge Parish Library's Facebook page. My name is David Lotch, and I'm the genealogy librarian for the Parish Library. Tonight, we are proud to have with us noted genealogist Jennifer Mendelson. Jennifer is a journalist and a ghostwriter by profession, and her work has appeared in a wide variety of publications from People Magazine to New York Times to McSweeney's. Her work in genealogy focuses on Jewish genealogy and the particular challenges of that field, as well as adoption and immigration. In tonight's talk, Think Like a Journalist, she combines these two fields. So please welcome Jennifer Mendelson. Jennifer? Thank, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. And I am uh, glad that everybody down there is back uh, and having power to watch this presentation and that everybody is safe. Um, so um, this talk is going to tell you a little bit about how I came to genealogy, which is sort of a slightly untraditional path, but um, it will be important to what I'm about to say after. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will be off. All right. Okay. So as David said, this talk is called Think Like a Reporter to Avoid Rookie Genealogy Mistakes. So in the last couple of years, um, I have gotten a lot of attention, um, including a lot of media attention um, for my work in uh, genealogy. Some uh, screenshots of appearances I've done uh, on television. This is an article about me in the Washington Post and the New Yorker and in peak ridiculousness. Um, this is a shot of me on Norwegian television. Um, I also appeared in uh, the best-selling book by Danny Shapiro. Um, I helped Danny discover the identity of her biological father, which uh, was completely unknown to her, uh, that he was anyone but the father that she knew. Um, uh, uh, and it happened simply by taking an ancestry DNA test. But for a long, long time, I was not the person being interviewed. I was the person doing the interviews. Um, for over 20 years, I had a long career as a journalist writing for newspapers and magazines um, uh, all over the country, mainly writing feature stories. I also, during my time as a journalist, um, developed a sort of special interest in um, debunking. I loved sort of digging down and finding out the real story behind uh, stories that people thought that they uh, knew what was going on, but the real story was something different. Um, and there was a joke, one of my friends uh, gave me the nickname Mendel Snopes, because just like the website Snopes, they knew that I could always find out uh, the real story behind things, even if it was something that uh, everybody believed to be true. So I have to say, um, a lot of people start their genealogy journey by saying that they were always the kid uh, who, you know, sidled up to the old people at family functions and always wanted to know everything about the family. And I can tell you quite assertively that I was absolutely not that kid. I was a journalist. I had no interest in family history. Um, and probably a big part of that was the fact that there was already uh, that kid in my family. And that kid was my brother, Daniel, uh, who is pictured here with our uh, beloved maternal grandfather, Abraham uh, Jaeger. And on the left there is Daniel's, you know, typewritten circa 1973 uh, family history. So Daniel was the one who dug in and wanted to know all of the family stories. In fact, Daniel dug in so deeply uh, that in uh, 2007, I believe it is, uh, Daniel wrote a book which became a bestseller internationally in which he really dug in and he tried to tell the story of what had happened to six members of our family who perished during the Holocaust in a little town that is now in Ukraine. Um, so suffice it to say, you know, the, the, the heavy lifting on that line had already been done. However, that all changed in 2013, um, as these things often do with a Facebook post. Uh, I saw a Facebook post uh, about a documentary that was being made about a matzo factory on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And it mentioned that the matzo factory was on um, Rivington Street. And I remembered that my mother had uh, 
cousins who lived on Rivington Street, and I stupidly Googled their names and Rivington Street, and uh, up popped the 1940 census, and I started poking around and became really hooked. Two weeks after that discovery uh, and Google search, I was chatting with my husband's 95-year-old grandmother, who is pictured here. Her name was Frida Pertman. Frida was a Holocaust survivor uh, from a little town in Poland called Voyin. She had lost her entire nuclear family in the Holocaust, both of her parents, her only living grandparent, all six of her siblings, and just about every other aunt, uncle, and cousin she had ever known. But that day in the car, because I was thinking so much about, um, I had been working on my own tree on ancestry and thinking a lot about immigration, I asked her what I thought was a relatively simple question. I asked what she knew about America when she was growing up in Poland and whether there was a lot of buzz about going there. And she said, no, not really. But then what she said is, well, you know that my mother had two older sisters who went to America before World War I. My mother was supposed to join them, but then the war broke out and she never could. And I sort of looked at her and I said, your mother had two sisters who went to America? Well, what happened to them? And she got very quiet and she said, I don't know. And I, she said the war broke out, they lost touch. And when she finally arrived in America in the 50s, she sort of wrote a letter to somebody who she thought might know where her aunts were and it never went anywhere. So she forgot all about it until that morning in 2013. And I looked at her and as I later wrote, this is a woman who could not afford to have two aunts unaccounted for. I said, mama, if you had aunts who came here, you have family and we have to find them. So I went on a bit of a wild goose chase, but by hook or by crook, even though I knew nothing about genealogy, one thing led to another, led to another, and I discovered a ship's manifest that appeared to be the manifest of one of those ants arriving uh, in 1911. Um, she told me that the two ants uh, went to Chicago and that one of them had died of cholera there none of which turned out to be true, a very good lesson for a beginning genealogist. But I sort of did what I do. I treated it like a story. And I just thought, well, if I'm going to find this woman who landed in, uh, in Boston, in, uh, well, she landed in New York, headed to Boston in 1911, I'll see what I can find. And there was an address um, uh, to where she was headed. And I just sort of followed the trail the way I would follow a story. And it led to the most extraordinary discovery in our family ever. I found the two aunts who had not gone to Chicago and who had not died of cholera. They lived long and happy lives uh, in the suburbs uh, of uh, Boston. And much to Frida and everyone in our family's shock, I went back to that 95-year-old Holocaust survivor uh, to, uh, a couple weeks after that initial conversation in May of 2013. 2013, and I said, Mama, you have three living first cousins. And it was pretty much the most important thing um, I've ever been a part of. Um, it brought her so much joy and so much peace, and it was incredible for everybody involved. So I did what I did, what I do, which is I wrote a piece about this incredible experience of reuniting this 95 year old Holocaust survivor who'd lost her entire family with three first cousins that she didn't know she had. And it was um, quite well received, I'm happy to say. But then something really interesting happened. After the piece appeared, a friend of the family called me and said, I read the piece you did, and it seems that you know how to do genealogical research. And I said, I don't know, I'm sort of one for one, but sure, what do you need? She said, well, I don't know if you know this, but our father was adopted. He was born to an unwed teenage mother in Brooklyn in 1928. We have a little bit of information about her. Do you think you could find his family, his birth family? So flush with beginner's luck, and again, really not having any idea what I was doing, I dove in, and this is an actual piece of the search that I did using the information they had given me, um, coffee stained, as is the way that I work. Um, and 
I just began to dig, once again, treating it like a story. If I'm looking for a woman named Dorothy Newman, I knew a bunch of facts about Dorothy Newman. How do I find her? And while I was doing this, I had a bit of deja vu. I remembered a kind of puzzle I used to love to do when I was a kid. They're called logic grid puzzles. And if anyone is familiar with them, you're given a set of facts about a set of people and you have to match the facts to the people. And I realized that doing this genealogical uh, research was exactly like those puzzles, which I had always loved because you could sort of sort people and say, well, no, that's not the Dorothy Newman I'm looking for because this doesn't fit. And that is not the Dorothy Newman, but I can rule in this Dorothy Newman as a possibility because that does fit. And sure enough, at the end of that search, I was able to reunite this 87 year old man with the half sisters that he never knew he had. And at that point, I was two for two, and I was feeling pretty flush as this um, cartoon that somebody drew me on uh, Twitter shows. So I started really getting into the genealogy research and I started, you know, doing genealogy for friends and I started working on my own tree. And then I realized that I could find things that other people were having trouble finding. And I realized like, I'm not the best genealogist in the universe. I would never pretend to be. But I started thinking, why is it that I can sometimes so easily locate documents and records and people that other people are really struggling to find? And I realized that it was because I had spent 20 or 25 years at that point as a reporter. And being successful in genealogy taps into many of the very same skills that I had worked so hard to develop as a journalist. What are those skills? I was really good at telling and finding stories. I was good at solving puzzles. I was good at sleuthing out information. I was really good at always making sure that I had receipts and sources and that I wasn't just sort of repeating what other people said, but that I had the documents to back up what I was saying. As I said earlier, I was good at busting myths and anyone who's done any genealogy know that it's all about finding out the truth behind the myths. Perhaps the most important skill though on that list is the last one, which is just knowing who and how to ask when you don't know. And I always say, people ask me all the time on Twitter, well, you know, how would I get started finding X, Y, Z? I, I am not a walking encyclopedia of every single document source and, uh, you know, uh, possible source out there. But what I do know how to do is to sort of, find the people who will help me find what I'm looking for. And that's a really important skill. I think a lot about this story that I worked on um, in my early days at uh, People Magazine. This is the July 11th, 1994 cover of People. Uh, Jackie Onassis had just died and this cover story was about her boyfriend at the time of her death. Some of you may recognize him. His name was Maurice Templesman uh, and he was a uh, South African diamond merchant. Now, I was a young and green reporter working at People Magazine in the DC Bureau. I walked into work that day and I was asked, I asked what, it, what it was that we were working on. And the reporter next to me, who was a much more seasoned reporter, said, um, we're working on this Maurice Templesman story. And the way People Magazine works is the country is divided into territories. So when a big cover story like this is happening, each region is responsible for reporting its piece of the story. So this reporter told me that what she was doing, because we were in DC, was calling all of the African embassies because she thought that perhaps somebody at one of the embassies had interacted with Maurice Templesman um, because of his work in, in diamonds and because he was South African. And it was like a light bulb went off over my head. And I thought, that's how you get the good stuff. I mean, somebody maybe in New York from People Magazine was going to get to, you know, call Maurice Templesman on the phone and talk to him directly. But the richness of the story is going to come from all these sort of ancillary people. And I think about that a lot when I'm doing genealogy. What is my equivalent of calling the African embassies? If I can't get directly to Maurice Templesman, what other people around him are going to build his story for me? 
In another example of that, this is a story that I did uh, in January of uh, 2003 for USA Weekend Magazine. Actor Matthew Broderick was uh, then appearing in an ABC version of the classic musical, The Music Man. And my crazy editor, who I can say is crazy because she's also a dear personal friend, had the idea for the sidebar that you see at right, which was not only was I going to go to New York and interview Matthew Broderick and talk about uh, his work in The Music Man, but she said, you know, The Music Man is sort of the quintessential American high school musical. Wouldn't it be fun if we did a sidebar and we found all sorts of famous people who had also played Harold Hill in high school? I was able to find a bunch of famous people who had played Har Harold Hill in high school. And I think, again, that's how I do genealogy. I think creatively about how to read, how to reach an elusive target. I like to think of it kind of like a dart dartboard. As I said earlier, when you're reporting a story, often your subject is alive and it's possible that you could even just reach out to them and talk them directly, the arrow um, hitting right in the center. But you also wanna use all of those collateral rings to gather information about your target. They're all gonna build your story. Um, and if you can't go directly, you're gonna think about what else you can do um, to find that information. I, I think about, um, you know, great podcasts like uh, S-Town or Serial, um, where people start with just the tiniest grain of information. The, the podcast Serial is this, I mean, the podcast S-Town is this incredibly gripping story that started because somebody left an intriguing voicemail message on the reporter's um, a voicemail. And going from that, it just builds and builds and builds and builds. I think also when something happens in the news, let's say something terrible, like a man takes a grocery store hostage, right? And you see that headline. Well, the next day, the newspapers all have all sorts of information, right? About who that man was, what he did for a living, where he lived, um, why he did this, you know, what his family said. Well, how does that happen? That just happens from reporting. You start with a tiny nugget of information. Something has happened. A man has taken a grocery store hostage. And then you just sort of tug and tug and tug until you build the story. Well, in genealogy, it's the exact same thing. Um, however, what we use to build our story are documents. And the specifics may change from search to search. But the clues are always there and you are going to build your story using those documents. They may come from voter registrations, obituaries, an address on a manifest, the contact person on a manifest. But people's lives leave a document trail. And if you were trying to track people down via genealogy, you just need to find the path that those documents have uh, have left. Now, I see people all the time sort of going about it very willy-nilly. Um, uh, as David said when he introduced me, my specialty is in Jewish genealogy. I see it in the Facebook groups all the time. People start out and they say what they're looking for. They're looking for a great-grandfather named Abraham Cohen, who was from quote-unquote Russia. His wife's name was Bessie Feinberg, and they owned a deli in Cincinnati. And somebody will reply, Oh, you know, I had neighbors growing up in New Jersey whose name was Feinberg and they were Hungarian. So let me call them. Well, that's not how you're going to have success. You don't you wouldn't start a magazine story about a Russian immigrant named Abraham Cohen who had a deli in Cincinnati by researching the restaurants of Cincinnati. And you wouldn't do it by researching all the Jews of Russia and you wouldn't do it by trying to track down Cohen's who lived in Milwaukee when the guy that you were looking for lived in Cincinnati. What you want to do is zero in on your Abraham Cohen and your Abraham Cohen only. And that's how you get you, you find success. So how do you do it? I like to joke that the method that I follow is called the law and order method. Um, now, hopefully everybody watching this has at least uh, seen a single episode of Law and Order, but on the off chance that you haven't, Law and Order is a police procedural. 
every episode works exactly the same way. It opens, there's usually a dead body. They show you this and the address, the person, the dead body is found at 179 East 75th Street. The cops go to check it out and they, uh, they find somebody who uh, knows the last person who was with the deceased uh, before they, they died, uh, a guy named Mike. They were having drinks together and they say, but Mike doesn't work here anymore. He, he transferred, a, he got a new job a couple of years ago. He works at Sharp Data over on Fifth Avenue. So what happens in Law and Order? You see this you hear that sound. And that is the way the story unfolds on Law and Order. And I like to say that when you do genealogy, you're doing the exact same thing. You're following those dun-duns to where the story is leading you. And you just have to keep your eyes open. And if you do, the information is there and you can, you can follow clue to clue and you get a really rich story. So where are those dun-dun clues? They're in every single document you find. They're in the list of people in an obituary, which gives you the names of married sisters and the places they, they live. Every single one of those is a dun-dun. And your next scene, you're gonna research every single one of those people because all of these are gonna help you tell your story. Um, in this obituary, which is the obituary of the father of uh, writer Buzz Bissinger, there's an interesting dun-dun that I happened to notice immediately. It says that Harry Gerard Bissinger was the dear brother of a man named Eli Kaufman. So immediately I wonder, why do the brothers have different names? Are they maternal half-brothers? Is there some other story? Was one adopted into the family? That's a dun-dun. I want to figure that out. And all of that is going to make my story richer. I, I always say the data is telling you a story. It's up to you as the reporter slash genealogist to make sure you are listening carefully. That means if you're looking for the Proctor family in the census and you see Thomas Proctor and Betty Proctor and their children uh, living in Virginia, if you're not careful, you're going to miss that another member of the family is living with them as well, an 84-year-old father-in-law named Burwell Jones. That's a dun-dun. Now we wanna follow Burwell, see what he can add to the story. Um, on the right there, I had just found a marriage record for um, a man in New York City named Barney Sherritt. And uh, according to that marriage certificate, his mother's, Barney Sherritt's mother's maiden name was Wolitsky. But I wanted to go backwards and find Barney Sherritt as a, as a child living in the census. I wanted to know more about his parents. So I started searching for uh, Barney Sherritt's and I found a Barney Sherritt, the right age, uh, living, on, uh, living in Manhattan. But what drew me to this document is if you look carefully, he's living with a relative who has the last name Walitsky. Ding, that's a dun-dun. Um, you, sometimes people um, don't look carefully enough and miss clues that are all there. That's why you should always be really careful about making sure that you're getting all of the information out of your document. If there is a child who is 10 years old and it says that the parents have only been married for a year, that's a clue you should pay attention to. If the mother is not old enough to be the biological children, biolog biological mother of the children living in the household, that's a clue. And my favorite, always, always, always pay attention to the people listed as borders because very often they are not borders, they are family members. Sometimes the information pops up in places that you don't expect it. Um, in this case, this is a, a draft registration. Um, actually, I apologize. The, the next one is place that you don't expect it. Here you would expect it, but this draft registration is a great source. It gives you the place of birth for the, the person. Um, in this case, the town of Chernovitz uh, in, in Austria-Hungary. But sometimes it pops up in places you don't expect it. This is a marriage certificate from New York City. If you're not paying attention, you have the golden ticket here, which is the name of the town in Italy that both the bride and groom come from. And again, that's a dun-dun. Now you know they were from Mazzaro del Valle. Then you're going to go look for records in that place to sort of build the next level of the story. I do a lot of immigrant research. One of my very favorite is the contact people on Manifest because after a certain point, travelers had to give you the name and address of the person in the old country that they had left behind, their closest relative, and on the second page, the name and address of where they were headed. That is a gold mine. 
every single address that you can connect to a person is a huge clue. And you can actually search backwards on Ancestry. You can put an address in the keyword slot um, and, and search backwards for mentions of that address. I am a big fan. If I have an address, but I can't find the person, I sometimes Google the address or search just the address on newspapers.com to see what comes up. Um, I recently was too lazy. I, I needed my, uh, my, my own father's childhood address in the Bronx and I was too lazy to look it up. So I Googled Mendelssohn and the name of the street. Something came up on Google Books where my uncle, who gave his name and address, which is why Google found it, um, was a witness in a really fascinating criminal trial. Found that through a simple Google. Um, there can be lots of Abraham Cohens with wives named Sarah and sons named Jacob, but addresses are great because there is typically only one Abraham Cohen with a wife named Sarah and a son named Jacob who lives at 224 East 4th Street. So when you think about that logic grid that I spoke about earlier, these are clues that lock the people into the grid. You know that you have the right Abraham Cohen because the address matches. One of my very favorite tools is Steve Morse's um, ED Finder. You can reverse search the census using just the address. So let's say the contact, uh, the, the arrival person's name is hard to read, but you can very clearly see the address. You can go to the census that is closest in time to the arrival and see who was living at that address using this tool. When the process works well, it looks like this. Every little clue and done done leads to the next and to the next and to the next. And before you know it, the story unfolds and you have more information than you ever uh, planned on. So I want to show you an example of what this looks like in practice. This is a case where I found the obituary of a man named William Gold. Um, and uh, the obituary mentioned several of his brothers and sisters. And I already knew about all of these brothers and sisters. However, it mentions that he had uh, a brother named Samuel Gold, who was new to me until I found this obituary. So I, of course, want to build out my story. I want to be thorough. I want to find Samuel Gold. So. The other really important thing to remember is that people sometimes get intimidated. Well, how am I gonna find a Samuel Gold and all I know is that he's the brother of William Gold? Well, if you think about it, you actually know a certain, you know more information about this mysterious Samuel Gold than you realize. So you have to think, what do you know? Well, I know that they are brothers and generally speaking, brothers will be within 20 or so years of each other. And people always love to find, you know, point out the, the exception. Sure, there are exceptions, but to get started, we're looking for a man who's about 20, within 20 years of uh, William's age. We're gonna assume that like his brother, uh, he was born in the same place or close to it. Obviously exceptions there too. Um, that place would be depending on the year because they were from the Austro-Hungarian province of Galicia. It might be called Austria, it might be called Poland. We know that Samuel Gold died before 1971 because he's mentioned as the late Samuel Gold in his brother's obituary. So I began to search. Mm -hmm. This guy popped up at me. He is a Samuel Gold born 1898 in Australia. It says he has a wife named uh, Annie and a daughter named Rose. But one thing that popped up at me, popped out at me about this particular Samuel Gold was his occupation. It said that he worked as a garage owner uh, in the automotive industry. And I knew that that was the same profession as the two other Gold brothers. And one very convenient thing that makes genealogy somewhat less daunting than many people realize is that people are creatures of habit. So it wouldn't be surprising if a set of brothers all worked in the same profession. Again, that doesn't prove this is my Samuel Gold, but it's a good clue. And again, if you're not paying attention and looking at all the information, you might miss it. Well, I was able to find the petition for naturalization of that particular Samuel Gold because the address on the naturalization matched the same one that I had found in the census. And I really began to believe that this was my Samuel Gold um, because of a few things on this document. Number one, Samuel Gold is asking, um, he says that he uh, actually arrived in the US under the name Israel Gold Hirsch, and he's asking the court to change his name to Sam Gold. 
Um, I already knew that the original name of the Gold family was Gold Hirsch. Um, and I also knew that their mother's name, was, their mother's maiden name was Zwiebel, which will come to play in a moment. So it says that he arrived on the 15th of March on the Calabria. That's a done done. The next thing I want to do in my journey is immediately go look at the manifest uh, from the uh, March 15th, 1921 for the Calabria and see what I find. And sure enough, I find my boy Israel. Slightly confusing if you're not familiar with um, uh, Jewish uh, Galicia research, but um, because of vagaries in the law, Galician Jews often use their mother's maiden name uh, for legal purposes. So Israel Goldhirsch actually arrived as Israel Zwiebel. And I recognize the name Zwiebel because I already knew that was their mother's maiden name. But I know this is my guy. He's from the town of Bukach, where they are all from. And most importantly, he is headed to his brother, Max Gold, and an address on Maryland Avenue, which I know is the address of the correct Max Gold. So this is my guy. However, I see a very interesting piece of information. It says that his, brother, his contact back in Europe is a brother-in-law named Leib Neufeld. I have never heard the, late, the name Leib Neufeld uh, before, this, uh, before I saw it here. However, for a single man to have a brother-in-law, that typically means that this man, if it's being used literally, is the husband of a single man's sister, which is interesting because I didn't know that the Golds had a sister. That's a done done. So the next stop, I go to the records uh, for their town, Bukach, and I'm curious, who is this Leib Neufeld and who was he married to? Uh, and I find a mention of Leib Neufeld in the records from uh, Bukach. I find him mentioned in a marriage record for his daughter. And what that record tells us is uh, it's a 1923 marriage record for a Charlotte Neufeld, who is the daughter of a Leib Neufeld and a woman named Hula Rosa. And it tells us that Hula Rosa is the daughter of a woman named Zwiebel and a man named Goldhirsch which certainly seems to suggest that if Lieb Neufeld was uh, Sam Gold's brother-in-law, that this Kula Rosa Zwiebel uh, Goldhirsch was a sister that we didn't know they had. That is the original record, just because it's beautiful. Also a very important thing to do is always look at the original records and don't rely on indexes because very often information is misindexed, mistranscribed. You wanna go right to the source. So I, I was very curious, was there a sister that we didn't know about? Um, so I searched for more information about this Hula Rosa and I couldn't find it. But what I did find was I did one additional search for Leib Neufeld, just covering all my bases and thinking, well, what else can I find? And very interestingly, what comes up is uh, a, a record that Leib Neufeld, the widower of Hula Rosa Neufeld, nay Zwiebel Vel Goldfish, who died on the 18th of February in 19, 1915 in Bukach. Well, Leib got married again, and the date, date of death of his first wife is mentioned on this second marriage record. Now, did I start this search looking for the date of death of Sam Gold's sister? No, I didn't even know Sam Gold had a sister, but that's where I started. And if you just keep following the clues and following the clues, it all opens up. And again, now we know that Sam Gold had a sister that wasn't mentioned in his obituary, um, probably because she died in Europe so many years earlier, but, and we knew that she had a daughter, more relatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think, all right, I'll go through this. I'm, I'm, I, I want to make sure we have time for everything. Um, now I was following the Dundons on William Gold's wife, whose name was Elizabeth London um, Gold, and she was actually born with the name Leah Landa, and it became Elizabeth uh, London. I started following the Dundons, and I discovered that when she arrived, she was headed to an uncle named Isaac Landau at an address in Philadelphia. So I followed the Dundons. I found that guy, Isaac Landau, her uncle. I wanted to find out everything I could about him to build out her tree. And I found his arrival. When he arrived in 1902, he said he was going to what looked to me like a cousin named Max Pabliski. And the address is very clear, 2512 Stonehouse Lane in Philadelphia. So I did all my tricks. 
I could not find any Pobliski family uh, living in Philadelphia, and I could not find who lived at 2512 Stonehouse Lane at the time that he arrived. But then I got smart and I used wild cards and I did a search on family search again, pulling on my resources, thinking, well, what do I know about this Pobliski family? So I did a wild card search and I said, I'm looking for someone with the first three letters P-U-B and the rest is the asterisk sort of subject to anything that might follow. And I suspected if this guy was a cousin of Isaac Landau that I gave a 30 year age range and I knew that he would have said that he was born in Russia. And when I did that, I discovered that it wasn't Publisky. The name was, there was a publicer family in Philadelphia at the time. And when I began to research them, I discovered that there was a Harry publicer who lived at 2512 Stonehouse Lane. So now I can open up the, pub, the publicer branch of the family and that's how I find the good stuff. And just in my defense, I show you this, which is how the publicers were listed in the census. The bottom uh, rectangle shows that it says 2512, completely illegible. So that's why I couldn't find them. Now, how does this play out in my own tree? Um, well, I started, that's my paternal grandfather, uh, Abe Mendelssohn, about whom we knew very little. Um, I will tell you the sum total of the information I had about my grandfather. I knew that he was born in Regalafia. I knew that he had lots of brothers and sisters who had all died. Uh, I knew his father's name was Isidore and that possibly Isidore had a brother somewhere named Wolf. And he once told me that he might have some uh, cousins in Cleveland. When my grandfather got married in 1912, he did not know the maiden name of his own mother. So suffice it to say that I was starting from scratch. But I wanna show you how many dun-duns there were in a single document. I found the petition for naturalization of my great-grandfather, Isidore uh, Mendelssohn. And the first arrow shows you that he tells me that he tells us that he was born in a place called Schenberg, Latvia, that I'd never heard of. Um, he also tells us in the second arrow that he arrived on a ship called the Titania uh, on July 20th, 1892. Well, I can tell you right now, you can spend the rest of your days and nights searching for the arrival of the Titania on July 20th, 1892, and you will not find it. It is a completely invented vessel. They came on a ship called the Gothia uh, on, uh, uh, in August, August 8th of 1892. So very important to remember that sometimes uh, people either get it wrong or don't remember. And the third arrow points to a piece of information that I'm gonna come back to later. And it's the name of the man who witnessed my great grandfather's naturalization. So I'm doing an abbreviated version here, but suffice it to say that I followed all the dun-duns in that document um, and found something wonderful. I found the, the elusive uh, brother Wolf, my grandfather's uncle Wolf. And the reason I was having so much trouble finding him was I discovered through a long and complicated process that he was going by a completely unfamiliar name. Like many uh, Eastern European uh, Jewish immigrants of that era, he changed his name from Wolf Mendelssohn and used the name William Shear. But suffice it to say, I found him. And when I found uh, William Shear's petition for naturalization, I got very excited because he lists all the names and dates of birth of his children. And this, these names would be the names of my grandfather's first cousins. And we had no idea that my grandfather had any first cousins. So I searched for the first one I saw, uh, a, a son named Henry, who it said was living in um, New Haven, Connecticut. And I thought, well, uh, there, there probably aren't as many Henry Shears as there are Shears in New York City. So I'm gonna search first for that Henry Shear, my grandfather's first cousin who lived in New Haven, Connecticut, which led to the greatest uh, find in the history of my genealogical ex, uh, exploits, which is that my grandfather's first cousin who we didn't know existed, Henry, AKA Heine Shear, was a professional baseball player. Uh, he played for the Philadelphia Athletics from 1922 to 1923. Uh, and in 1925, his teammate was the very famous baseball player, uh, Mo Berg. Uh, it's joked that they are perhaps the only Jewish double play combination in the history of baseball. And I learned upon doing subsequent research that uh, Henry Shear was signed by the great Connie Mack. And if anyone is a baseball fan, that name will mean something to you. Um, I have since discovered that I'm related to the guy who invented the rabbit ears television antenna. And actually just in the last two weeks, perhaps 
I, I, I was going to say putting Heine to, to shame, but um, I am a distant cousin of BJ Novak from The Office, which um, was a lot of fun to discover. But anyway, uh, just to be sure, we DNA tested um, some people related to Heine Shear. It all came back correct, and uh, we had our proof. So I like to say it's like playing a game of concentration. You always have to remember the cards that you've seen and turned over. So just pay attention. If it helps you um, write it all down when you're transcribing a document, write down all the information that document contains um, and maybe some of it, it, it won't mean anything now, but it will come back later. In this case, when I found William Shear's naturalization, I looked carefully and recognized the name of one of the witnesses. Uh, I did not know who that person was, but I recognized the name because it was the same person who had witnessed my great grandfather's naturalization, a man named Herman Gabrielson, who lived on Fulton Avenue in the Bronx. And again, two brothers both have the same person witness their naturalization. That might not mean anything. Maybe there was a guy who just was friends with both of the brothers, but it seemed like a dun dun clue that was worth investigating. So I want to find everything I can about Herman Gabrielson. I very easily found Herman living at that uh, address he gave uh, in the census, he said he was from Russia, said he was a, a painter, that he had been naturalized. It says CIT for citizen. So I found his naturalization and discovered, interestingly, that this guy, Herman Gabrielson, was from Bauska, Latvia, which actually um, turns out to be the place of origin for my Mendelssohn family. So then I thought, hmm, well, he could just be a friend from the old country who happened to live near the, the Mendelssohn brothers, and that's why he, he witnessed their naturalization. But I continued to search because it intrigued me. Then I discovered uh, through a, a genie tree um, that uh, Herman Gabrielson's mother's maiden name uh, was Hanenson, which was a name I recognized from my tree. I continued to investigate and discovered that Herman Gabrielson was a first cousin to my great grandfather. Um, I also was able to document that using a DNA match and that opened up a huge new branch of my family, the Gabrielsons, um, with all sorts of interesting finds. And all of that came from just noticing the name of the witness on the naturalization. So what do you do if you're following the Dunduns and you hit a dead end, a brick wall? You can't get any further. Well, the other thing I learned as a reporter is persistence. It's that reporter's instinct to say, if you know the information is out there, you are not going to stop until you find it. So if you're not, if you know someone is out there and you're not finding them, maybe it's because you just need to search differently, not that it's not out there. And I sort of have that, um, you know, that, that little bug in my ear or whatever you call it, like it frustrates me. If I know that somebody exists, there is a guy and who had an address on Stonehouse Lane in Philadelphia, why can't I find him? I just keep readjusting my search strategy until I find him. You have to be persistent. Remember, somebody out there knows Maurice Templesman. Somebody out there has a great story that's going to make your story good. It's up to you to figure out how to get to them. So in my world, the world of Jewish genealogy, we have a lot of garbling of names. So I, I like to use this example. Um, these are all the same woman whose name has been misspelled um, three different ways on three different documents, but they're all her. So if you're looking too literally, you're not going to find what you're looking for because the names that you're looking for may have been mistribed in the census. Um, uh, I was looking for a man named uh, John Pavone. He came up in every uh, census and I knew he lived in Porchester in New York, couldn't find him, couldn't find him. I took out the last name. I just looked for every John living in Porchester the year that I wanted, who was within range. And sure enough, I found him. It had been misindexed as John Savone. Um, in the next case, I found a tree. Um, I was interested in a family with the surname of Zengut and uh, some Buddy who had a public tree on Ancestry noted that they were unable to find the family um, in either the 1930 or the 1940 census. Well, I was able to find them uh, in the 1930 and 1940 census because their name had been butchered. Um, if you are searching too literally for Zengut, you're not going to find them because it has been misspelled as Zekungrust. Um, I found this, again, just using first names. Um, I do this all the time. People often say, I can't find my grandfather on a manifest. 
Well, I sometimes find people by just looking for anybody, uh, I, I, if, I, if it's children, I will look for just children born within two years who traveled on that ship. And so often the names are so mangled, that's why they're not coming up on search. It's not that they're not there. If, for instance, you are looking for the arrival of a woman named Sarah Harkavy, you probably will not find it by searching for Sarah Harkavy because she has been mistranscribed as Luia Galkawi, and her town of origin is Adowa Zoguda, which, as far as I know, is not the real name of any town or anything close to it in Eastern Europe. So remember, the and it's not, if you look, if you look, it's not that that's it, it says that it's just been misindexed by someone who couldn't read the handwriting. In this case, uh, those of you who might be familiar with uh, certificates of arrival after 1906, immigrants actually had to have their arrival certified to say that they were on the ship that they arrived on. My great grandfather could not have gotten away with doing what he did because somebody would have to say exactly what ship he arrived on. Um, in this case, it's telling me that the woman I was looking for um, arrived under the name Toba Erzatel uh, uh, on 1913 on the New Amsterdam. So I thought, well, that should be easy enough. I'm looking for a Toba Erzatel who arrived on the New Amsterdam on September 22nd, 1913. Except for the fact that she has been misindexed as Ranba Wuritel. So again, I found her by looking for a woman born around the year uh, that she said, who arrived on the date that she had. I might have, sometimes I use uh, the, the town of origin to anchor people. I know that they're going to say that they're from Scala. So I look for somebody who says they're from Scala and I found her. Wild cards can be your best friends. If you search the New York City marriage index, looking for marriages, um, I, in this case, I was looking for Sarah Hart Cavey, uh, whose manifest I just showed you. I knew that she had siblings and I wanted to find them in New York City. I knew that Sarah's father's name was Abraham and her mother's name was Fanny Steinberg. If you search the New York City uh, marriage index on family search, searching exactly for Harkavy with a father, Abraham, and a mother, Fanny Steinberg, you get exactly one hit. You get Sarah Harkavy's marriage certificate. However, if you use wild cards and do a search like this, uh, I use H question mark to the question mark uh, stands in for one letter, then RK and an asterisk standing in for any letters. And then I just looked for a father whose name started with ABR. I found Sarah's siblings. That's because her brother, Harry Harkavy, has been misindexed as Harry Harkori. The father's misname is misspelled as Abraham. And the mother's last name, it won't come up under Steinberg because it's spelled phonetically as Steinberg with an H. Uh, this is uh, Sarah's sister, Dory. Her last name has been misspelled as Horkothy, which will not come up if you're searching for Harkavy, but I found, I found them both. Um, I'm going to skip. That was another done button. I'm going to skip through these just in the interest of time. Um, so what are some of the pitfalls of the Dun Dun Trail? Um, one of them is to rely too much on ancestry hints or, you know, other uh, services like MyHeritage have uh, the equivalent of hints. Um, people think that every hint that they see and is, is meaningful and they scoop it all up and they dump it all in their tree and they make a lot of mistakes. Um, those hints are generated because other people have put those documents in their tree and that doesn't necessarily mean they're correct. So uh, you want to be really careful about remembering your grid and making sure that you're matching every person to the correct information. Um, another mistake is to assume that every document you need will be online. If a search returns the record that it seems like it could be the one you want, you don't automatically assume that it is the one that you want. People have the same name. This I, I don't know why this is such a hard concept for people to understand, but people assume if a document pops up, oh, that must be the one I need because it's the person with my name. So you need to educate yourself a little bit about where the documents you're looking for are. And if the naturalizations for Jersey City are not online anywhere, which I happen to know that they're not, you have to order them, you need to know that and you need to follow the done done and find out how do I get a naturalization for Jersey City. Um, don't forget common sense. Sometimes people are so eager to, um, you know, put stuff in their tree that they end up 
putting in scenarios that make no sense. I like to say I've practiced Occam's razor genealogy. Occam's razor is the principle in math that tells you that the most likely scenario is the least complicated one. So is it possible that a family would have children born on three different continents in five years? Um, yes, it's possible. Is it likely? No, it's much more likely that you have the wrong people and you need to keep looking for the people that you're looking for. Um, also, don't overthink it. Sometimes Google can be your friend um, and you might find what you're looking for that way. A good metaphor is to think of yourself as a gatekeeper rather than a vacuum. Don't suck up all those hints on ancestry, um, uh, but be discerning. Um, in journalism, the old joke is that if your mother tells you loves if your mother tells you she loves you, you should get a second source. Um, and you shouldn't just be accepting information as true because it's in someone else's tree. You want to find the documentation that proves it. And you want to make sure that your logic grid um, is working, uh, that you're not adding, you know, uh, people sometimes say like, oh, I found my grandmother's manifest, but they don't realize that their grandmother arrived as a single woman under her maiden name and the manifest they found is for somebody with the married name. Um, and it means that if Abraham Melnick died in 1919, the Abraham Melnick who fathered a child in 1922 is not him. Um, it helps to think of ancestry hints as the sirens uh, that will you know, bring the sailors onto the, the rocks. Um, it, it's okay to ignore the hints. Um, I see people attach naturalizations for people who never lived in the states that the naturalization is from, or they attach the naturalization of a man who has, you know, children named Sarah, Fanny, and Clara to the tree of a man who only has sons named Jacob, Abe, and Harry, or they attach the grave of a man, of a woman whose father's name was Abraham to the tree of a woman whose father's name was Moshe. Um, and you are listening to all of this, I'm sure, and saying, oh no, I couldn't possibly do that. Well, let me just show you a few of the doozies I have uh, found while working on Ancestry. Now, one important thing is you can always see where people got their information on Ancestry. And if their only source is someone else's tree, that should be a warning flag um, because they're not basing it on documents. They're just saying, well, somebody else said this, so I'm going to copy it this. And in this case, that means that they added the uh, a man born in 1854 who has one child born before he was born and one child born when he was eight years old, which obviously can't happen. So if you're seeing that the only source is other trees, you should be uh, very careful. Get that second source, even if your mother is telling you she loves you. Um, in this case, we have the very precocious marriage uh, of somebody in Aberdeen, Scotland when they were three years old. Um, this guy really, really uh, was precocious. He had his first daughter when he was five, his second daughter when he was eight, and then just for good measure, he also registered for the World War I draft when he was eight. I like to call this one Hope Springs Eternal because this man died in Chicago in 1933, was somehow still living in the Bronx in 1935, and just for good measure, he got divorced in Florida 36 years after he supposedly died. And if you need one final reminder, and then I'm going to close, remember Herman, Herman Gabrielson, my great-grandfather's first cousin? Well, this is the birth certificate of Herman Gabrielson. Um, it is a Jewish record from the town of Bauska, Latvia. Herman was born, uh, he was born Gabriel Gabrielson on the 12th of April, 1869. The record, as you can see, is in Russian on the left and in Hebrew on the right. However, if you look for Herman on Ancestry, you will find uh, that he is in this person's tree. And Herman is uh, in, he, he's, he's married to one woman and has his actual children, Benjamin, David, and Jean. But then he has one, two, three, four other spouses and about 20 other children, all born at the same time, um, somehow while he was, he was married to his wife, because they have mixed up every Herman Gabrielson on Ancestry, apparently, and added all of these people into the tree. And my personal favorite is that they have taken my cousin, Herman Gabrielson, um, whose birth 
who's Jewish birth record from Latvia, I just showed you, and they have added, they have made him uh, Norwegian. And they have Herman born in 1861 in Wisconsin, where there was a different Herman Gabrielson born in 1861, but it's not our Herman Gabrielson because we just saw his birth record. And they have given him um, uh, Norwegian parents named Ola Matthias Gabrielson and Johanna uh, Savaland. Um, and they have him uh, starting out in Wisconsin and then ending up in the Bronx and uh, they have him marrying uh, two different people, his correct wife and uh, a different wife. So, so that is all I have for you. Um, I am happy to uh, answer questions if you have them. And um, thank you. Well, thank you. That was, uh, that was very good. And we appreciate that. Appreciate you taking your time. If anybody has any questions on the Facebook, uh, please. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, well, let me answer this one. This one says, can the genealogy databases be uh, accessed to the library card? Uh, right now, Ancestry Library Edition is available uh, at home and in the library to anybody with a library card. Family Search is free to anyone. Uh, what were some of the other databases you looked at? There was, I saw the, the Polish one. What was that one? Um, those are all, you know, uh, once you sort of know where you're looking for, again, I do immigrant research. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for to go back overseas, there are all different sites um, to use for those records. The Latvian archive site is totally free. Um, that birth record I pulled is totally free. You just need to know where you're looking and you need to know how to um, read enough Russian or Hebrew in my case to, to find them. Um, the Polish records, those are all free. They're on the Polish archive site. Um, you just, you know, you just need to know where to look. Um, mm -hmm. But I also use uh, people use my heritage, uh, which is a subscription site. Um, but those are those are kind of the main ones I use. Okay, yeah. So and we're talking about foreign languages here as well. Um, how do you? Because it looks like your research has covered Russian, Polish, Hebrew. I don't know what else. Um, how do you deal with foreign languages? Do you have any strategies for anybody who's found an immigrant ancestor who came from a foreign language speaking country that well, they don't speak the language of. So here is my confession. I only speak English. Okay. My Hebrew is marginal. I am learning. I never learned as a kid and I am trying to learn as an adult. I can just get to the point where I can read names on gravestones, but I can't read full records. I don't read anything else. And yet I find these records all day long. You just have to sort of learn the, I've, I've done Italian research. I don't speak Italian at all. You just have to learn the formula. You figure out how the records are organized. And then if, you know, for the sake of, of uh, argument, we'll talk about a language like Italian where at least you can recognize the alphabet. You can read names, right? So you can find the names and you just learn the formula. The word for father is this. So the place in the record where the father's name is hit is this. So this is the father's name. I Google the months of the year I, in various languages. Um, you know, I, the one I keep bookmarked is Polish because that's what I use a lot. Um, I just this morning was helping someone find a record and it said his mother's date of birth was November 22nd, 1909. I knew where the records from that town for the year 1909 were. I started scrolling. I looked at my, you know, and records are records, you know, like you don't have to read the language to understand there's headings and you can use Google translate if you don't know what any of the headings are, but very often they're sort of obvious. It's like a word like nomen, which clearly means name and you can read month and day. And in this case, there was, uh, I, I recognized a couple words like the word for legitimate and illegitimate. And in the very far right column, there was a date and I suspected that it was the date that the parents got married, legitimizing the marriage. And I was correct. I sent it to a friend who speaks Polish and I said, can you just confirm what this says? So you, it's, it's easier than it, it, at first it seems really daunting, but I will dive into records in any language like Hungarian. You, you just have to sort of figure out the formula and then plug in the specifics. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, <laughs> Miss somebody what asked, done, what, 
Okay, somebody, uh, first of all, yes, this will be on the Facebook Live. We'll, we will keep a record of this on the Facebook Live for anybody who came in late. Um, but uh, somebody missed the bit about what a done done is and what, what that specific word means. So could you just go back and... Sure. The done duns uh, are a phrase I use from Law and Order. When you watch Law and Order, every time the story progresses and they get, you know, the the, the detectives get a new clue that's going to help them solve the murder and propel their investigation forward, you hear that sound and it sounds like dun dun. Um, and I like to say that when you follow the clues in genealogy, you're doing the same thing. Every new clue that you get is a done done and you want to go to the next place where that information is propelling you to find the next piece of the story. And uh, what is it you're, are you currently working on anything, any big projects? Um, I do client work. Um, okay. uh, you know, I, I, the only clients I take are uh, Eastern European uh, Jewish families because that's what I know best. Um, I am about to start the Progen program, which um, some people may be familiar with, which is an intensive uh, professional genealogy study group that goes on for 14 months. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, so that's that's what I'm working on. Okay. And uh, oh, you mentioned your Twitter a few times. What's what's your in case anybody here wants to follow you, what's your Twitter handle? My username is at clever title TK. Clever title TK. Everybody got that? Okay. Does anyone have any further questions? Anything else coming in? Does not appear that we do. Okay. Um, well, Jennifer, I want to thank you for taking the time out to talk to us tonight. That was illuminating. And uh, I know I picked up some tips that I hadn't thought of before. And I certainly hope our viewers have as well. And uh, I think we all appreciate the, the lively uh, presentation. It was really well done, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, before we go, I wanna thank um, Cassandra Hurst, who is here in the room with me managing the chat, and Josh Hill, who is behind the scenes pressing the buttons and making us all look good. <laughs> so, um, all right, anything else? Any further comments? Just remember Maurice Temple's men. Somebody, okay. somebody at the embassies knows Maurice Templesman. So you have to, you have to think about who that person's going to be for you and how you can get to them. So. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. Oh, and, and thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it very much. Take care. And, uh, you too. And we're done. <laughs>